there's not a lot of things that I genuinely hate in radiography, but if there's one thing that's at the top of my blacklist, it is scatter radiation. And that's because scatter radiation hates us as x-ray technologists. It's our number one source of occupational dose. And much more than that, it's going to seriously impair the diagnostic quality of our images. So today I wanna to talk about how we can return the favor to scatter radiation and destroy it with extreme prejudice. So what exactly is scatter radiation? Why does it hate us so much? And how do we destroy it are the big questions that we're asking today. And oftentimes it's just easiest to look at a picture and say, this is what scatter radiation is. So we see on this image on the left, we got a whole lot of scatter. It is contributed to what we call radiographic or image fog on the image, which results in a in decrease in uh, image contrast versus this image on the right, exact same patient, exact same area. Um, and yet we've had a significant decrease in the scatter that's reached the image receptor. And so we see an improvement in the contrast. A large part of scatter radiation is coming out of what we call the Compton effect. Um, so, and it contributes to a total destruction and image contrast. This occurs throughout the diagnostic range of energies, but as um, average beam energy increases, scatter radiation increases as well. Um, it increases in percentage of the remnant beam. So we see as uh, KVP increases, we see a decrease in the percentage a photoelectric effect that's occurring inside of the patient and an increase in the percentage of scatter. Um, another thing that contributes to an increase in scatter would be a larger field size. So by reducing collimation or increasing the area that we're imaging, we would expect to see an increase in scatter and again, a decrease in image contrast, um, an increase in patient dose, as well as a potential increase in occupational dose. And then, of course, anytime we are imaging a larger patient or a thicker part of the body, which we'll return to in just a moment, we would expect to see scatter radiation increase. Now, um, it's maybe a little bit um, too much to focus solely on Compton effect. There is, of course, also coherent scatter. Um, the reason I don't uh, poo-poo uh, coherent scatter quite to the same degree that I do the, co the Compton effect is that coherent scatter does not result in ionization or increased dose to the patient. So Compton effect does all these awful things, plus it ionizes the patient's body. So we see in this illustration here on the right, a scatter, a photon um, incident on uh, an electron. It interacts with that electron in the uh, atom's valence shell. The uh, ejected electron is sometimes called a Compton electron or a recoil electron. And then the scattered photon having a reduced um, frequency or increased wavelength, it goes off in an, an other direction. And if we wonder what exactly is happening at that point of the uh, interaction, we can zoom in here and see, oh my goodness, we better back up in WA. So it's all joking aside, what are we going to do about that? And that's where grids step in. I love that this illustration here from Upstate Ed calls uh, a, the grid the anti-scatter grid. It just sounds kind of awesome. But basically this thing works kind of like the bouncer in a club. It allows for uh, primary x-rays from the primary beam to pass through the spacing material, um, but any scattered x-rays are gonna be caught by the lead strips. You can think about it as kind of like a comb. It's like we're combing through the x-ray beam and we're going to allow um, the hairs or whatever, I don't have a lot of them, that, uh, that are straight to pass through the comb, but if there's like a stray hand or a stray hair, yeah, that's the right word, um, it would be caught in, by, the, uh, by the lead strips in this instance. So we're interested in this relationship between um, the spacing between the lead strips and just how tall the lead strips are in relationship to the uh, primary beam. So let's talk just a little bit more about the solution. Now I've got a whole nother uh, video just working these types of problems, talking about grid characteristics, grid ratio, grid frequency, um, plus um, some prob problems related to uh, adding a grid to uh, technique, those types of increase in techniques that are going to be required. Because if you think critically about what's occurring here, we're reducing 
um, the amount of X-ray photons that are actually reaching the image receptor. Now, the ones that we're reducing are primarily scatter photons, right? But it, this does create a reduction in the amount of exposure at the image receptor. So anytime we're reducing exposure through something like grid placement between the patient and the image receptor, we're going to need to increase patient dose, increase our mass in order to make sure that we don't wind up with quantum model or, or some other kind of artifact on the image. So I'm, I'm saying grids are great, they improve image contrast, but they do it at the cost of patient dose. They require an increase in patient dose in order to compensate for the exposure that's lost to the grid itself. So if you want more information, uh, I'll put a link to the other video uh, in the comments below. So of course, there are problems with the solution. That is the story of our lives as x-ray technologists. And probably the number one problem with uh, grids is the potential for what we call grid artifacts or grid cutoff. Uh, Mori artifacts, which result from uh, using a high ratio grid with a digital system as we've increased uh, our use of digital radiography, we're reducing the amount of grids that we're using. We're especially have completely gotten rid of high ratio grids because they create artifacts similar to grid cutoff artifacts. These two artifacts here come from Radiopedia and they both state that they're grid cutoff artifacts. To me, they look more like Moray artifacts, but I'm not gonna split a bunch of hairs on that. Um, primarily what we need to know as, as X-ray technologists is that we don't, if we need to make sure that the grid is aligned appropriately to the um, the image receptor, the Im both the image receptor and the uh, the primary beam. We want it perpendicular to the primary beam, perpendicular to the image receptor. Um, if we're going to have any kind of tilt on the image, like if we're using a grid during portable imaging, we want to make sure that we are tilting along with the grid lines, not against the grid lines. If you're wondering what I mean by that, you can imagine the grid is working like Venetian blinds. And so think about the directions that you can see through Venetian blinds versus the directions that you would not be able to see through the Venetian blinds, the exact same geometrical principles going on when we use a grid. Finally, there's just the question of like, when do we want to use a grid? Was using a grid on this chest x-ray even appropriate? And one of the best kind of rules of thumbs that I found is in Quinn Carroll's book, he mentions that uh, if a body part's thicker than about uh, 10 centimeters, it can generally produce enough scatter to require a grid. So that 10 centimeter rule is a helpful rule, um, particularly if we're looking at something like knees that are right there on the boundary line. Um, me measuring that part and determining uh, whether or not to use a grid is, 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 is intelligent. Um, and one thing that uh, also Quinn Carroll pointed out in a recent presentation is we may be doing away with grids altogether. There may be uh, software algorithms that we can use um, that can just reduce the amount of scatter that we're displaying on the image through post-processing. So I, I would predict that within the next five to 10 years, we just do away with grids altogether. But for right now, they're our number one ally in reducing scatter, especially when body part thickness warrants. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Please comment, ask me any questions. Like I said, I'll, I'll leave a link below for uh, additional videos that may be helpful. Subscribe and share with your friends.